Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Premier Chelsea, your source for all things Premier League, but starting with Chelsea first. Coming to you on your speakers and headsets, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm one of your hosts, Jackie. I'm here with Alex this week. Rahul is out scouring the transfer markets, but no worries. We have Ben back with us. Ben, welcome back. Good to be back. How are you guys? We're doing well, thanks. I'm actually going to pass it over to Alex because he's back in touch with us now. And Alex, maybe you can bring us some of the new rumors circulating around Chelsea. Yeah, absolutely. So we've heard, obviously, for a while now about potential links of Jules Koundé, um, the French uh, Sevilla player, um, as a potential center back uh, backup for Chelsea. Well, he would probably walk into the starting lineup at this point with Rudiger leaving. Um, but he supposedly is injured for France and has uh, will need to undergo surgery. I'm not sure if that's happened yet. I was seeing a quote uh, from uh, the manager saying potentially that it was it was a serious injury. It's a hamstring injury. That is something he'd been dealing with for a while. Um, and obviously, I think that throws a bit of a wrench into the Chelsea Kunde transfer saga because this is a player that we've known we've been linked with for a while, was almost seen as essentially a done deal. Um, but at this point, the, the question is, does that, does that throw off any of this, any of the negotiations for the move? How might it affect uh, the terms? Uh, and supposedly Barcelona is also heavily linked to Koundé, but uh, we'll have to see whether there's any, any truth to those stories. I'm not sure, uh, Ben, if you've got any insight there or thoughts on that. Yeah, I think you outlined it really well that there's a two sort of side plots to the Jules Kunde narrative. One is the injury, the other is late interest from Barcelona. As far as the injury is concerned, it doesn't affect too much, although there's disappointment all around that he was risked for the French national team. It's a minor injury as far as I'm concerned. Some are saying he's got hamstring problems. Others are calling it a pelvis injury, but he's undergone surgery. And as far as Chelsea are aware, that doesn't change anything because they knew about the injury before he was risked at international level. So it's a minor injury that isn't going to really affect timescale beyond any sort of recovery period because the player obviously has to undergo a medical. The bigger issue is going to be whether or not there's interest from Barcelona. And if that materializes, because people close to Jules Kunde say that that's a football club that he's always been very interested by. Barcelona are busy in the incoming sense. They want Lewandowski to join the club as well. And that's a move that the striker is also very keen on. So it's hard to sort of determine when Barcelona come to the table, one, how they're going to finance these deals and two, how they're going to clear space within their squad and quickly enough to get deals done when there's other suitors circling. So my understanding at the moment is there's nothing advanced between Barcelona and Jules Koundé other than a sort of nagging desire of the football club Barcelona to strengthen in that particular area but they've not actually got an agreement in place with the player and Chelsea do and I suppose the only spanner in the works is if Barcelona somehow choose to activate the release clause and in doing so either force Chelsea to pay more or the two clubs end up in a bidding war and maybe a few weeks ago when I referenced the fact that Chelsea might have to pay somewhere close to the release clause or even formally activate it. People were surprised by that because I think that there was a general consensus at that point that the final price agreed between Chelsea and Sevilla would be sort of 10 or even 15 million euros lower than the 68, 69 million euros release clause that has been widely reported. But then if Barcelona are going to come in and either directly activate that or there's a narrative being put out there that that's their intent, then it allows Sevilla some kind of bargaining. And I think that that's what the Barcelona interest is at the moment. It is a bargaining tool. And you often find that in the transfer market that it's in Sevilla's interest, even if they deny it, it's in the agent's interest and it's in Kunde's interest to all be saying there's other interest 
and that yeah. interest is at a higher level than Chelsea's financial value and that the player is keen on that move. And Chelsea aren't going to be too concerned by this because, as I say, they've already agreed terms with the players. So I don't think there's much that Kunde can do to kind of play the market unless he U-turns and comes back on that deal that he's agreed and says, hey, Barcelona offering me more. Are you prepared to match it? But I think Chelsea will be quite firm on the offer on the table to the player so the only thing holding up that deal is, again, Sevilla and Chelsea getting to a number and Sevilla could delay, especially if they know they've got a few more days or weeks due to the recovery from the injury, they could delay fixing on a price with Chelsea in case the Barcelona interest materialises and becomes more advanced. But make no mistake, nothing has hugely changed with Kunde at the moment. Chelsea are still the front runners and Barcelona's interest needs to be backed up by more advanced talks before it becomes a real threat to derailing that deal. Okay, that's definitely encouraging to hear, I think, because Chelsea fans for a while have been hoping this one gets over the line. So sounds like at the moment, at least, there's not too much to worry about there. No, I mean, not too much to worry about, but the transfer market works like this, especially early on. And if, for example, Dembele ends up joining Chelsea or De Jong is allowed to leave and Manchester United agree a price, then suddenly Barcelona have got both space on their wage bill through Dembele and a relatively healthy transfer fee through De Jong. And then at that point, you'd expect them to prioritise Lewandowski first, but after that, as they look to strengthen defensively, Kunde could become a very realistic target. But Barcelona, despite the bravado, despite the links, despite the history and so on, are in a weaker position than Chelsea because Chelsea have already had some outgoings like Rudiger and they've got other forthcoming ones coming. So they'll not only have the space on their wage bill, but in addition to that, and regardless of the outgoings, there's the desire of the new ownership group to spend and bring in much needed reinforcements, particularly in defence and midfield. And then the Lukaku situation necessitates a striker or a forward thinking player, an out and out goal scorer is needed as well. Whereas if you compare that to Barcelona, they've got no space in their squad. They've got no financial leverage. So they're going to need outgoings at relatively big prices to alleviate the burden of the wage bill. But even if they can, for example, with Dembele leaving on a free transfer, reduce their wage bill, they still have to find physical cash if they're going to finance a deal like Kunde. So it's all very well saying that they've got the leverage to bid above Chelsea and activate a sort of, you know, in dollars, I suppose it's about 70 odd million dollar release clause, but they can't just magically make that 70 million dollars appear in order to take the negotiation out and activate something that then allows them to talk directly to the player. So the transfer window is long. And if Barcelona are to get Kunde, a lot of other aspects have to fall in place first. And they're going to have to try and delay that deal as long as they can. And maybe the injury helps them, even if it's only minor. Whereas from Chelsea's point of view, they'll want to move more decisively to try and get this one wrapped up before Barcelona have the opportunity to move more definitively. Sounds good. So Ben, this is all interesting, especially given we need a striker. We're looking at midfielders and defenders. But in the last week or so, Chelsea has been linked with two goalkeepers. And so I'm wondering if you can share some information on that front, specifically around who these guys are and if that means Kepa is looking for a move out. And so the names we're hearing, and forgive me for my pronunciation, one is Thomas Strakoska, who is a Greek-Albanian goalkeeper coming from Lazio. He's at 27 years old of age as well. And then the second gentleman is Gabriel Slonina, who's from Chicago Fire, so coming from the United States, and he's 18 years old. We're hearing Real Madrid has interest as well. And so don't know if you've got any updates on that front. Yeah, let's start with Gabriel Slonina, who will obviously be known across the United States because of where he's currently based. And this is a logical signing in Chelsea, uh, very much chasing this as a keeper for the future and somebody that they can effectively sign now on their books and then in all likelihood loan straight back to Chicago Fire. And therefore, it's not a Kepa replacement. It's not a goalkeeper that would be factored into next season as far as playing term time is concerned. But uh, talent that Chelsea and, as you correctly say, Real Madrid 
have been chasing for a long while. And Wolverhampton Wanderers, another club, by the way, that have historically been in the mix as well, but no way have they advanced that deal at the moment. So Chelsea are the front runners at the moment, and the fee is likely to be about 10 million euros. And for an 18 year old, that's obviously big money. Real Madrid had fought hard over the last few weeks, but I think now there's a reasonable consensus talking to sources that Chelsea are the front runners and a number of big European clubs have been looking at Slonina uh, because he's seen to be the complete package, technically speaking. He's got good command in the air, a strong shot stopper, commanding in his own box, capable of being developed into more of a sort of sweeper keeper role because he's good with the ball at his feet and you know a long shelf life of investment as well even with that big outlay only at 18 knowing that you can pay that money and develop a goalkeeper at 18 years of age and through clever loaning and development and buy-in from the player with pathways to maybe the Chelsea first team you know you can sell that and say well by the time you're in your mid-20s you're going to be a force in European football and that gives you a long, long time to develop. And as long as the goalkeeper has buy-in and is prepared to sort of go from loaned back to playing in your under 23s to being a number two and then finally getting your first opportunity, as long as they see that journey with Chelsea Football Club, by the time you kind of get to the age of 23, 24, 25, if it all works out, you get real longevity. You get 10 plus years potentially and then that 10 million that you've outlaid in euros is an absolute bargain fee, even though it seems like a lot of money from the perspective of an 18 year old. And then obviously from Chicago Fire's perspective, they see the money coming in, but the opportunity to be the first port of call as far as a loan back is concerned. So they don't lose anything either in the short term. And at 18 years of age, he's already got good experience within MLS, having played I think 14 games last season and over 10 in the previous season too. So this all makes sense as one for the future from Chelsea's perspective. Whereas with Strakosha, it's a little bit different because you're buying someone who's 27 years right. of age and has played well in excess of 200 games for Lazio. And that includes... 23 times last season. So I think that if Slonina arrives, then Chelsea have fulfilled their sort of goalkeeper's complement for the season. And then if Strakosha comes, it's evidence that Kepa will leave because right. you can't have Mendy and then Strakosha coming in and then Kepa remaining as well. And Kepa will still see himself as someone that can and in his mind should be a number one goalkeeper at a top Premier League club. And don't be surprised if a Newcastle United come in and uh, sort of abandon their plan A at the moment, which remains Dubravka maintaining their number one spot. And they were looking at, for example, a Dean Henderson or even like a Kasper Schmeichel at my club, Leicester, as coming in and being added to the ranks. But if Kepa becomes available, it wouldn't at all surprise me if a, a club like Newcastle suddenly say, that's the right fit to be number one. And that would obviously be bad news for Dubravka. But I don't see Kepa just staying around at Chelsea as a number two. And I think Mendy is the number one for the new season. So it's an interesting move kind of for Strakosha in that respect, because how does he see himself at only 27 fitting into the pecking order and having been used historically to playing for Lazio and having played in sort of half or so, just over half of their Serie A games and 30 plus games in all competitions last season for a big club. He then again would in all likelihood be coming and sitting on the bench for the vast proportion of Chelsea's Premier League games. So, you know, that's an interesting move. And for me, the fact that Chelsea are looking at a player of that calibre tells you that Kepa has probably privately intimated that he doesn't want to stay at the football club and just be a number two next season. And there's maybe a belief that he can't oust Mendy as the number one. And it's an interesting dynamic as a player. These number two goalkeepers are always anomalies and they have to have a set type of personality because they're either knowing in their head they are the number two 
and training accordingly, playing accordingly, waiting for their first team opportunities and they're content with that either because of the package on offer or their age or they just privately realize that the number one goalkeeper has something that they don't. But Kepa doesn't fall into that category and that's what sort of makes the Chelsea situation so interesting with him because Thomas Tuchel cannot say to Kepa, you're only a number two. That's not what the coaching staff would be saying at Chelsea, even if it's implicit, even if it's known, even if just the game-by-game selection proves that to be the case, Kepa would have to be incentivized in training, feeling like he could still challenge Mendy and why? Because there's not much between them. Kepa is a world-class goalkeeper, but Mendy, I think we all know, isn't going to be out. But I don't think anyone on the Chelsea football side would say that. So then Kepa has to sort of work it out himself through the fact he's just not getting the game time and then come to a decision as to whether he's happy with that dynamic and pay packet and lifestyle. And who knows, one day the opportunities might come. And then the beauty of that number two is if you do do well, you can just get a run out of nowhere in the side. And then it's Mendy that has to put two and two together and work out if he's been usurped in the pecking order or it's only temporary. But, you know, they're both very good goalkeepers. And even though Mendy has done excellent, and I think Chelsea fans would always put him on the team sheet at the moment, Kepa's got a big decision to make this summer. And until that's clarified and Chelsea know for sure if they're selling him or not, I don't think we're going to see them move in the market. So if the move for Slanina ramps up, It's just because they want to bring in a young goalkeeper for the future. And that's nothing really reflective of Kepa or Mendy. But if we see the Strakosha move happen, I think that almost certainly tells you that Kepa will depart because there isn't room for Strakosha and for Mendy and for Kepa since they're all going to want to be either playing or be that defined number two. So then there's one goalkeeper too many. Yeah, and yeah. that's a wonderful insight because I think it really takes us to a point of Chelsea having to solve the Kepa issue. And this is an interesting way of solving it because you said Kepa doesn't see himself as a number two. He can go find better playing opportunities for many clubs. And if Strakosha is interested in being a number two or potentially coming in for a few years and maybe fighting with Mendy for the number one position, that'd be very, very interesting. So great insight, but I'm going to pass it back to Alex because Rather than going outside the club, we want to talk about inside the club now. So, Alex, what do you have for us? Yeah, so we know um, Chelsea obviously has always had a a robust loan system. And this season is no exception where we're thinking about some of the loanees who might be returning from uh, different clubs and whether they will be going out again, whether they will be staying and getting an opportunity with the first team. So some of the the prominent names, I think most Chelsea fans have had Connor Gallagher on their radar after a very impressive season uh, with Crystal Palace, um, really running the midfield and obviously a slightly different type of player, but giving almost a uh, Mason uh, Mount-esque work ethic and offensive and defensive contribution. Um, So that is one question. Would Connor Gallagher come back? We've also got Armando uh, Broha, um, who is with the striker position, potentially opening up again here, obviously Lukaku looking like, you know, that's, that's going to be something we have to address. Assuming we don't want to trust in only Kai Havertz as a number nine, we probably need some more depth there. Um, does Armando Broha get a chance at striker or does Chelsea dip into the market again there? And another name that I think people have heard a little more and more about recently of Levi Colwell, uh, who had an impressive spell at Huddersfield, um, who just barely missed out on, on promotion, I believe. Um, if I, I may be wrong there, I'm not sure. Uh, but they they uh, that, that is another one with some of the center backs departing from Chelsea. The question remains, is he ready to make a Chalaba type step into the first team and start uh, proving his importance to the squad or does he need more development? So any thoughts on, on those particular players would be, would be interesting. First thing to say is that the three names that you mentioned are exceptional talents and we can start with the last one, Levi Colwell. And as you correctly say, He did almost get promotion to the Premier League. Nottingham Forest won the playoff final. Huddersfield just missed out. But he had a really impressive spell and no better place to kind of 
learn your trade, in my opinion anyway, than a loan spell at a no-nonsense championship side. And he played 32 games in all competitions, scored a couple of goals as well. So proved that he can kind of cause havoc and win balls in both boxes. And for a 19-year-old, he's just got great intelligence, awareness and positional sense. And those are the sort of qualities that rightly have him build and compared to uh, John Terry, for example. He's got really good instinct and tenacity, but not to the point of kind of boiling over. And that's what I love about him. Sometimes with 19 year olds, you can see hot, cold, you can see them lose their temper. You can see them make silly mistakes, sometimes be overly physical, get sucked in and then end up leaving spaces. But when he's played in the system for Huddersfield, it's that rigidness, it's that discipline, and it's that composure that's really impressed me. And as a consequence, there's a number of clubs looking out for the 19 year old. And it will be a shame if Chelsea just let him go. So Everton are looking at him. Arsenal are even across him as well. And again, either a loan out to this time a Premier League club or alternatively a sale could be the two options there. And how Chelsea choose to handle Colwell might well depend on who they're able to bring in at centre-back or centre-back slash right-back. Because if they don't make the signings as quick as they can, then why not assess Colwell and see how far he is off the Chelsea first team? With Gallagher, I think that he had an absolutely outstanding spell at Crystal Palace. And it would be a shame if Chelsea don't reassess and work out where his place is in the team. And if some of the sort of more attack-minded midfielders are to depart with a Ziyech and a Pulisic, both potentially assessing their future, and then Jorginho and Kante in that central midfield, more disciplined, either box-to-box or more defence-minded role, are either past their peak or potentially could depart as well, then what you have is a player in Gallagher that could slot in and be very versatile and be developed into Thomas Tuchel's system. And he's proven at Crystal Palace when he's given a more free role, he is able to score goals. And to reiterate again, to go on loan to Palace and weigh in with eight Premier League goals is an absolutely outstanding return. And I was particularly impressed by him in the first half of the season. I don't think he entirely faded in the second half of the season, but he was box office. He was explosive. He was one of the best players in the Premier League in that position, especially in the first half of the season. So with Gallagher, it will be a shame if Chelsea agree to a permanent sale. But make no mistake, there is a whole range of clubs that do just want an outright sale with Gallagher, Crystal Palace being one of them, Leeds United are in the mix, Wolves, Southampton as well, Newcastle United have looked at Gallagher as well. So Chelsea need to assess and find out whether there is space in the squad for him. And again, much like Colwell, it's a discussion as to whether at 22 years of age, it's another loan or whether it's a permanent sale. And I think that Chelsea's preference would be loan, but I think Gallagher wants to know where he stands. And the difference between Colwell and Gallagher is that one is still a teenager and is quite prepared to be loaned out again. But you look at Gallagher and you almost feel sorry for him at this stage because he's joined Chelsea in 2019 in the middle of a pandemic. He kind of starts getting game time at different clubs. And then he's had Charlton loan spell. He's had Swansea loan spell. He's had West Brom loan spell. He's had Crystal Palace loan spell. And having made all those steps up and now weighed in with eight Premier League goals and won four England caps, he's fully entitled to be saying to Chelsea, am I part of your first team plans? And if not, I want to go somewhere permanently where I'm going to play week in, week out. And he can be confident from his Crystal Palace spell that his next destination can be a Premier League club permanently where he can settle and get on with his football career. And that's important because I think he does genuinely stand an outside chance 
of making Qatar 2022. But what's the only way he's going to be in Gareth Southgate's plans, having won those four caps? It's being settled. It's playing week in, week out. And it's starting this season like he began last season. And honestly, if he went to a Palace again, a Southampton, a Wolves, who, for example, could lose Ruben Neves and look at him as a replacement or a Newcastle, it's hard with Newcastle because... Bruno and Joe Linton in excellent form. So I'm speaking kind of hypothetically about these destinations, but he's the right fit for that type of club. And then let's say he goes and he starts the season on fire. Who knows? He could be in the mix for an outside chance World Cup call up. But if he stays on loan somewhere or if he stays at Chelsea and isn't playing that regularly because of the Mason Mounts and so on of this world, then he's definitely not going to Qatar. So that will be in his thinking as well. Not just what's my future this season, but do I have a long term future at Chelsea or is it better to make a permanent move now? And I'm wondering from his point of view rather than Chelsea's point of view, whether that will dictate the fact that he'll leave the club. So I think that the short answer is he's the most likely to make a permanent move. Cole will loaned out somewhere because I don't actually see Chelsea taking a punt on a 19 year old in that centre back position, despite the impressive loan spell at Huddersfield town. And then with Broya, I think that it's a case of Thomas Tuchel assessing him in pre-season. So you're going to get a lot of suitors for Broya in the Premier League and also in Serie A. Napoli are looking at him. Atlanta are looking at him. West Ham are the sort of front runners from the Premier League clubs. But the reason Chelsea haven't already sold and nothing has advanced is again because Thomas Tuchel wants to assess him in pre-season, which is something that I've said on this show and reported around about a month ago. And I think that that will continue. So it wouldn't remotely surprise me if Chelsea return first and then Tuchel looks at Broya in pre-season for a few weeks and then towards the close of the window, we work out whether a West Ham sale or a Serie A club is a possibility for him. And that's where I think we stand with those three. And they're three really sort of interesting players because on the one hand, you don't see any game time in any position for any of them right now. And that's why you can understand either a loan out or a sale. But on the other hand, if Broya goes to, say, a West Ham, a bit like when Lingard went to West Ham and scores a load of goals and Lukaku leaves, then you're only going to get Chelsea fans kind of going, oh, why did we sell him? And it's exactly the same for Gallagher. Imagine if you sell him and he has an explosive start to the season and ends up in the Qatar 2022 squad. And again, Chelsea are saying, why did we sell him? And with Colwell, I think that he won't be sold. He'll be loaned. So Chelsea will always have that opportunity. But with the first two, it's really intriguing because I bet the fan base is quite split. Some are thinking, give them a chance because they've seen what they've done. And others just wouldn't have them in the starting 11 or the squad uh, because Chelsea are quite deep in um, the midfield area and they'll be deeper in the centre-back area if a Kunde or a, a Bastoni joins, at which point a Colwell is obviously down the pecking order. And similarly, if Lukaku leaves, but a marquee striker comes in, it's very difficult to justify an argument that says Broya will start. So I, I'm split in my own head arguing it as well, but that's where I think we stand with those three. And Ben, honestly, I think the word you use, it will be a shame if we lose someone like Gallagher is probably the best way to describe it. Because me personally, I can't speak for all Chelsea fans. I do believe Chelsea play a lot of football every season, given the number of competitions we're in. I think we go up to 60, 65 oddish games. And if someone like Gallagher can at least crack into 30 of those games, I think it'll be a successful season. Now, Broha, I understand it needs to be settled through Thomas Tuchel and what's going to happen to Lukaku and all that. So it makes a lot of sense. But Let's stay on the striking front because we've talked a little bit about Gabriel Jesus and if Chelsea are going to move forward. You said last time would be an absolute bargain. We agreed with you. I think Arsenal are coming into the mix now. Just a quick update on what's going on there with Gabriel Jesus. Yeah, Arsenal haven't come into the mix. Arsenal were probably the front runners even before Chelsea and what levelled the playing field in terms of possibilities and negotiations was the fact that Chelsea were seemingly offered Gabriel Jesus and that possibility looked quite alluring, especially with Lukaku likely to leave. Arsenal are still the more likely destination for Jesus. And the challenge for Chelsea is in persuading Jesus, I think anyway, of the system and the style I think that Jesus was kind of sold on an Arsenal move before he was aware of Chelsea's 
interest after it was clear that Manchester City would be releasing him or selling him more accurately. And we know, by the way, that Jesus is leaving. And if you want the sort of clue on that, not that it's definitive, but Man City haven't revealed Erling Haaland's number. And some thought he might take on his dad's number, but it's more likely that he wants the number nine and Jesus is the Manchester City number nine and Manchester City haven't confirmed the shirt number that Haaland will be wearing. And usually that shirt number would be confirmed with the signing. So it's more than likely that that's a clue that Haaland is nine and Jesus will be sold. So the first thing is about a fee with Manchester City. And originally they were hoping for about 50 to 55 million. And as I reported, maybe a month or so ago, uh, Manchester City have softened and will let Jesus go for somewhere between 40 and 45 million. And Arsenal have presented a first offer, which is sort of seven or eight million lower than that. I'm talking in British pounds now, I appreciate to an American audience. When we hop between euros and dollars and pounds, it might get a little bit confusing, but um, Arsenal's bid has seemed as a little bit low, their opening bid, but they are in the process of returning with, with a secondary offer, which will be a little bit higher. And this is all expected. It's all part of the gamesmanship of the transfer window. And most are in agreement that Jesus isn't going to go for anything lower than the high 30s in terms of millions and then you know you have to then structure your deal and work out what the add-ons are and in all likelihood the add-ons will either be based on goal scoring targets or Arsenal qualifying for the Champions League so you might find that they get him for say 35 million with 10 million of add-ons or you may find they have to pay more like 40 to 45 million and then the add-ons will either be less but it's in that kind of ballpark and as you said when you asked me the question, that fee of roughly early 40 millions in pounds is a bargain fee for either Chelsea or Arsenal. And I would classify Arsenal as the front runners at this point, but I think that Chelsea are still very keen and they know they're going to have to replace Lukaku when that deal is done. Jesus is a proven goal scorer in the Premier League. Chelsea can offer him Champions League football as well. So it makes a lot of logical sense that Chelsea could be a fit. But I just think that at the moment, Jesus is sold by his role in Arsenal style under Arteta. And remember as well that Arteta was at Manchester City too. So there's some knowledge of that kind of operational style, that personality style. And this is the one thing I'd say, not talking specifically to Jesus, but just to be aware of, and it's definitely the case with Martinez, another player that Chelsea would like, but won't make the move to Stamford Bridge. And I think we can say that pretty definitively at this point, unless in to soften their stance. Lukaku's exit, assuming it happens, has to not have collateral damage. And by collateral damage, I mean Lukaku is leaving Chelsea because, in essence, there's other factors to some extent, just like a desire to go back to Italy, but he doesn't get on with Tuchel. The two don't get the best out of each other, either personally or professionally, either in terms of liking working with each other or fit tactically. And that's why Lukaku for the first time since his first spell at Chelsea, hasn't got into double figures in the league. So the longer the move drags on, the more we find Lukaku's been talking to Inter kind of unofficially over the last six months. The more acrimony there is, the more chance there is of other strikers, like a Jesus and certainly a Martinez, asking people like Lukaku, or asking Chelsea, what's Tuchel like to work with? What's training like? Um, is there a problem in the dressing room, etc.? And that's unfair on Tuchel in the sense that he's a world-class manager who is also very liked by the club hierarchy and a number of the players at the football club. So nobody's saying that Lukaku holds the majority view. But when you choose to join a club, you ask people you know. 
what's it like there? So Martinez will ask his great friend Lukaku, what's Chelsea like? And Lukaku will not give it a glowing recommendation, partly because obviously if he joins Inter, he wants to play with Martinez as well. But that's a danger with a Jesus just there in the background that he'll ask around. He'll say, what was the problem with Lukaku? He'll, he'll ask other players whether if he was the focal point of an attack, how much game time would he get? And he's a different player to Lukaku, a more versatile player for sure, but he's coming off the back let's not forget, of a Manchester City team where he was rotated. And I think that's the key word, the R word, rotation. And when he's weighing up Chelsea, even with Champions League versus Arsenal, I think he'll want to know whether a Chelsea move is going to make him the focal point and one of the first names on the team sheet. And then he'll be asking Arsenal the same question. And Arsenal are in desperate need of just a marquee flagship focal point. And I'm not saying Chelsea aren't, but Chelsea may bring in another striker because they've got that financial power, whereas Arsenal definitely won't because they've already signed Vieira. They're likely to bring in Tielemans. They uh, are hoping for Jesus and they believe they're front runners and they're close to agreeing that deal. And then from an attacking point of view, that will probably, unless they come in for Rafinha, but he's more sort of that wider player that can kind of come in and complement um, a player like Jesus, that will be their offensive business done. From Chelsea's point of view, if they bring in a Gabriel Jesus, uh, I say only, but a bargain fee of let's say 40 million, and then someone else becomes available in an attack-minded sense, who knows? And that someone else is obviously Lewandowski at the moment, it's unlikely, but that's probably Jesus's fear of like, yikes, I see all these players that can score goals from a Ziyech to a Pulisic to a Mount, and then what if they brought in a Lewandowski and me? Where do I fit in in the week in, week out? And then what happens if Lukaku doesn't even leave? Whereas I think Arsenal can basically say, join us, you're our striker, you're our focal point, you know Arteta, deal done. And that's probably the difference in where we're at in negotiation at the moment, which is why I think Gabriel Jesus is more likely to join Arsenal than Chelsea. But don't rule out Chelsea because they're still very much in the mix. Makes a lot of sense. I'll, I'll pass it over to Alex here to ask a few more questions about maybe some outgoings. Yeah, so you touched on Lukaku, which obviously uh, you mentioned uh, potentially him being asked if there's a problem in the dressing room. I would say from the Chelsea perspective, I would call him perhaps the, the problem in the dressing room. But uh, th that bias aside, uh, with Lukaku looking pretty likely to be making an exit in some form or another, one, one other one that I think the news has dried up a little bit more on lately is Azpilicueta, who I had seen recently a headline saying that hopefully, hopefully is true that he really didn't want to leave a sour taste in any mouths with, with an exit uh, in an untimely or uh, non-amicable way. So do you think that the potential Aspi move to uh, Barcelona is still likely? Um, or do you think maybe he will just accept a diminished role in the team and stay to keep things smooth at the end of his legacy here? Well, I think the point with Aspilicueta, as I said the last time we spoke, is that he doesn't want to leave on bad terms or with acrimony. And unlike Alonso, he's prepared to listen a bit more to the pitch from the new ownership group. And it's all very well assuming, I suppose, that Aspilicueta will have a more, as you put it, diminished role. But that's contingent upon Chelsea finding names. You, you could argue it the other way, that imagine if Barcelona got Kunde and Lukaku ends up going to Inter on a straight deal rather than a swap player deal. Then in Aspilicueta, you've got a 32-year-old that's capable of playing right-back centre-back. So if anything, he would be more integral to Chelsea, at least until the January window, when they're able to find replacements. This is based on a hypothetical of a worst case scenario. And the best case scenario from Chelsea's perspective would be that they get all of their defensive targets, and then they're probably happy for Aspilicueta to leave. So I think that Aspilicueta wants the move to Barcelona. But there's just so many players in that category. And that's the irony here that, you know, how are Barcelona going to bring in Kunde if that materializes Alonso and Aspilicueta plus Lewandowski and find the space and the wage bill without first getting some clarity over the futures of Dembele and 
De Jong. And even then, that's still only two out and four potentially in. And it's all very well saying that they alleviate the wage bill with Dembele and to a lesser extent De Jong and get a big transfer fee from De Jong. But make no mistake, Alonso is going to be well compensated at Barcelona. Aspilicueta is still going to be on a reasonable wage, pretty much akin to his Chelsea wage. Lewandowski is going to be on sky high wages. So Barcelona, for me, can't finance all of these deals, even if they appear to make sense in terms of small fees or no fees being paid. There's still that wage bill. And in many cases, like a Lewandowski link or a Kunde link, you've got to pay a big fee or a reasonably big fee in the sort of 40 or 50 million mark and a huge wage as well. So even if Alonso and Aspilicueta want a Barcelona move, it's not a given because of Barcelona's situation. And irony of all ironies, if you're Aspilicueta in particular, if you left and then Kunde joins, then you're in exactly the same position as if you'd have stayed at Chelsea and then Kunde had joined. So if I'm Aspilicueta, I'm almost wanting to go where Kunde doesn't. So I get some game time or just stay at Chelsea and then have that kind of stability. So there's all kinds of moving parts here, um, but I think the difference between Alonso and Aspilicueta in simple terms is that Alonso wants out and will go somewhere in Spain, even if Barcelona doesn't come off, and he's now determined that, having heard the new ownership group out, whereas Aspilicueta is a little bit more on the fence, and depending on Chelsea's incomings defensively, might still be persuaded to stay. So in an ideal scenario, both players want to go to Barcelona, but Alonso is like fixed on that, whereas there is more flexibility from Aspilicueta because of his relationship with Chelsea Football Club. And then with Lukaku, it is as we were. Chelsea want a deal to happen as long as it makes financial sense. Inter, again, uh, believe that they can get a deal quickly. There's no problem agreeing terms with the player. Lukaku's quite prepared to do everything he possibly can to make the move happen, including taking a wage cut. So it's all just about the format of the deal. Is it a straight loan deal and then a loan fee is required and Inter's offer of 5 million is too low, 5 million euros that is, and needs to be more than doubled. So, you know, 12 to 15 million euros should get the deal done, even though Chelsea ideally would want 20 million. Uh, but with a wage cut, um, that loan fee can be a little bit lower, uh, you know, assuming that Chelsea are going to be taking on a proportion of the wages. If Inter are going to pay 100% of the wages and get those wages down, then the loan fee may even be a little bit lower. But Chelsea are you know, conscious that they've got a 100 million euro player and 97.5 million English pounds. So they, they can't just give him away out of sentiment because there's bad blood between Lukaku and Tuchel. They have to negotiate something that makes sense. And at the back of Todd Bowley's mind is also, again, I've got a hundred million odd player who traditionally everywhere he's been has scored a ton of goals. And even a bad season at Chelsea still saw him, I believe off the top of my head, score eight times in the Premier League. So when you think about loan and if Inter can't afford to buy him outright, which we know they can't, rather than perhaps doing a staggered loan deal or a obligation to buy or an option to buy, perhaps at the back of Bowley's mind, unlike Thomas Tuchel, he's wondering whether just put him out for a season, see what he does at Inter, reassess the situation from there, make a bit of money from it, offset the wage bill. I don't think that's what Lukaku and Inter will want, but you can understand why Bowley sees the asset and doesn't want to just get rid of him um, because Chelsea um, are still wondering whether the situation can be salvaged. I'm not sure that relationship, by the way, between Tuchel and Lukaku can be salvaged, but you can understand why that is in their line of thinking. And then if they go down the other route, which is looking increasingly likely, uh, they need to find a, a way of getting a swap deal done. So Martinez is not a realistic possibility. Chelsea need defenders. Intra have got a lot of defenders that would be a good fit at Chelsea. Uh, Dumfries, uh, Bastone and Skriniar would probably be the three names that Chelsea would consider. And when you speak to a range of different sources at Inter, there's no sort of 
definitive progress yet as to who might be offered. So from the Inter perspective, it's a no on Martinez if Chelsea did just say we want forward for forward. It's a no on Bastone, but that might be tactical and hardball from Inter, although Bastoni's agent has said that he's definitely staying. And of the um, three names, Bastoni is the most settled in Italy for sure. So then that leaves Skriniar and Dumfries. And Chelsea would love Skriniar as well, but Inter are wondering whether they may be able to push Skriniar to PSG for a higher fee and then be in a better position to negotiate a straight loan deal um, with Chelsea and not have to give away another player. So Inter's concern is basically that let's say they give Bastoni to Chelsea and then end up selling Skriniar, then they've lost two of their stars and the fact they've got Lukaku in doesn't help them defensively. So they probably only want to lose one of their defenders or certainly their centre-backs. So if they think they can get a higher rate that's better value for them from PSG, then they won't allow a swap deal of Skriniar to Chelsea. And if Skriniar wants to go to PSG anyway, it makes financial sense. And then they'll play hardball on Bastoni and do a straight loan deal. So that's the inter perspective. Chelsea's perspective is more like, no, if we're going to give you Lukaku, we want the player. And that's what's complicating things and taking up a lot of the discussions at the moment. Chelsea are trying to get a Bastoni or a Skriniar at um, good value, if you like, Whereas Inter are feeling like they only want to get rid of one and maybe their best value is selling Skriniar to PSG at a higher rate. And eventually someone's going to have to make a compromise. And I think that Chelsea are playing everything right at the moment because they know that Inter want Lukaku. They know Lukaku is desperate for the move. So they've got all the leverage and they know that Inter are broke. So Chelsea are playing hardball to make sure that this deal happens on their terms, which is the right approach. And then with Denzel Dumfries, it's not that Chelsea are not interested. They absolutely are. And he, he's a great talent in mid-20s, so right at his peak um, last season at um, Inter. Um, I believe he um, probably... Um, turned into more of the player that we sort of saw two years ago when he was playing for PSV, uh, which is a, a goal-scoring fullback, played 33 games, I believe, in um, Serie A and scored five times. Uh, and the goals had kind of tapered off, actually, when he joined into a little bit in his last season for PSV. But two seasons ago, uh, he really took the world alight. A very consistent player um, and someone that, again, would be a really good signing. But right now, even though a right back or a centre back right back would be someone who um, Chelsea need, I think a, a specialist centre back is the priority. So it'll be interesting to see one, which player Inter are prepared to let leave if it's a swap deal, and two, if Chelsea are given a choice between Dumfries at right back or um, Skriniar, I think they they would prefer Skriniar. So these are discussions that are taking place at the moment. It's very fluid, but what I would say is that I think that despite the complications, despite the politics, despite the different dynamics, despite the two narratives, and despite the um, format of a deal, I, I think even though that makes it sound very complicated, one thing is for sure, which is they will find a solution here. Uh, and it seems clear now at this point that Lukaku will depart and will depart pretty quickly. Um, so in that respect, progress is being made between the two clubs. And I think from a Chelsea perspective, we all want this deal to go through, not because there's anything ill towards Lukaku, but we just want to make sure all of this cloud that's hovering around us will move on from there. Ben, I know we only have you for a few more minutes because you have a hard stop. So I want to wrap up. But before I wrap up, uh, other than Chelsea, is there any interesting transfer news bubbling in and around the Premier League that you can share with us? And then we can wrap up for today. Well, I mean, Gabriel Jesus to Arsenal is probably the disappointing one from Chelsea's point of view, but I do think that's quite advanced. I think that Tielemans as well yep. to Arsenal will be a done deal. And they've also, well, Porto have confirmed that Fabio Vieira yep. is joining as well. And Tielemans is more sort of that number eight can get box to box, can play a bit more defensively as well. Whereas Fabio Vieira, I, I would classify as an attacking midfield and they'll complement each other uh, pretty well. 
I, I think that Christian Eriksen is the interesting plot line within the Premier League at the moment. A few days ago, we heard and I confirmed that Manchester United had made uh, an offer that hasn't been accepted yet by Ericsson. There's interest from Tottenham and Leeds United and Newcastle. One thing I think is clear is that Ericsson won't agree new terms with Brentford, right. which is a shame because they were the club that put their money where their mouth was and uh, took a gamble on him. Uh, not a gamble because of his health, a gamble because he'd been out of competitive football for long enough that, you know, mid-season, there's a danger of rust. And it was the exact opposite. He came back so sharp that um, I, I think they got a brilliant bit of business there. But unfortunately for Brentford, I think the level of suitors in terms of what they're able to offer Ericsson is um, higher. And um, he is likely to pick between Leeds, Spurs, Manchester United and Newcastle. Uh, United are the most advanced in terms of putting down an offer, but that move is not a given. Uh, so watch this space on that. Uh, Spurs have confirmed Basuma. That's a superb bit of business for them. They're also interested in Lataro Martinez. But as I said before, uh, I don't think that Inter are going to be prepared to lose Martinez. And if um, Inter can get Lukaku in, then Martinez is going to be even more intent on staying at that football club. So even though I think that Tottenham will end up being quite busy still in the transfer market, I don't think that uh, Lotaro Martinez is going to be a realistic possibility for them. But that's an ongoing transfer to watch and a really interesting one as well. And then in terms of outgoings, I think the most interesting one and the most likely one remains Sadio Mane and Bayern are very, very close now to the point where everything is pretty much agreed on that one as well. I think it's going to be for around 40 million and the contract is pretty much waiting to be signed on that one. So Sadio Mane will leave Liverpool. He will join Bayern Munich. That one is imminent. There was a bit of back and forth on the fee but as I say, I think you'll find it's around $40 million, sort of um, early 30s in terms of euros. I'm not the best in my head at converting, by the way, between euros and dollars. So if anyone wants to stick that in Google Translate at around sort of 30 to 34 million euros, I'm sure that comes to about sort of 37, 38, maybe $40 million, but somewhere in that ballpark. That one, though, uh, isn't far off either. So watch this space. And uh, those are probably the main ones to watch as far as the um, Premier League is concerned. And then if, if you want the more like outside names, obviously there's Calvin Phillips and Rafinha at Leeds. Um, less likely Phillips will leave at the moment, but Manchester City are lurking. Um, Chelsea have looked at him in the past, but nothing particularly substantial there uh, yet. And, you know, Chelsea still might be holding out, as I've said before, for Declan Rice, but not this window, um, because he won't be available, I don't think, to anyone this window. Um, but Calvin Phillips to Manchester City is a possibility. Rafinha has been tracked by Arsenal and even Liverpool before. Uh, from Liverpool's perspective, their business might be done, though, after getting Darwin Nunez um, and Ramsey as well from Aberdeen. Um, but those are the kind of names that, um, you know, clubs uh, are still looking at and a little bit later in the window, certainly over the next kind of three or four weeks, we might see uh, some progress contingent on outgoings first. Um, but, you know, the big clubs um, look like they're moving quite decisively and definitively in the earlier part of the window. And as and when they get their targets in the next two or three weeks, uh, you may see business uh, completed and then the window um, has a bit more of a lull in it and that's what makes Chelsea and maybe this is why we're seeing a little bit of for want of a better word panic uh, when patience is needed um, from Chelsea fans because they're seeing Spurs move early they're seeing Arsenal uh, now start to move early they've seen Haaland come in at Manchester City uh, Chelsea fans have seen Nunez come in at Liverpool so everyone around Chelsea has made some kind of um, moves in the market uh, but I still think that uh, Chelsea, by the end of the window, will be on a par with all of those sides in terms of the business that they've done. All right. That's a lot of great information. Ben, thank you so much, as always, for being on. For our listeners, please find Ben at Jacobs Ben for Twitter and then for at Ben David Jacobs for Instagram. 
Uh, thanks again very much, Ben. Yeah, great catching up, guys. And I'll speak to you next week. Take care. See you all. Bye.